Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felden, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felding. Okay, good to see everybody in today, and uh, my, it's hot outside, but uh, at least it's comfortable in here so far. And uh, we appreciate the fact that all of you have come from near and far, and uh, we've got one as far as Enid. We've got some folks from uh, down at Sepulpa and out at uh, Oklahoma City, and uh, the rest of you from other areas around here, I guess most of you now from Tulsa. But anyhow, we appreciate your coming in, and uh, we just pray that the Lord will bless our time in the studio this afternoon. For those of you out in television, of course, we always cherish the opportunity to come into your home or wherever you're watching the program. I guess most of our letters imply that it's sort of a breakfast club. Uh, I think our program is on most areas of the country early in the morning, and uh, I just had someone again this morning. The fellow said, boy, he says, you're my early morning breakfast. So uh, again, for those of you out in television, we appreciate your letters, your prayers, and uh, naturally we have to thank you for your financial help because otherwise we couldn't stay on the air. But whatever, we just trust that again the Holy Spirit will open the Scriptures, and uh, we've just come back from a long trip and a lot of seminars, and I guess that's the most thrilling statement that we hear over and over and over for the first time in my life. I'm studying my Bible and I'm enjoying what I'm reading, and so we feel like we are making some progress in that department. All right, we're going to go right back into where we left off in our last program, which is in Hebrews chapter 3. And uh, we finished down through verse 11, and we're ready for verse 12. Now, we have to remember that in these two chapters especially, 3 and 4, we're almost going to be repeating it and repeating it to the place you'll almost despair of it. But it's a rehearsal of Israel's rejection at Kadesh Barnea to go in and take the promised land because of their unbelief. And so that's the whole thrust of these two chapters in Hebrews, is the horror of unbelief. And I always like to point out, you see, it was only just a few weeks previous to the Kadesh Barnea experience that Israel stooped to the level of demanding Moses or Aaron to make a golden calf. You remember that? And in the worship of that golden calf, they went down into the very uh, abyss of moral degradation and followed in the steps of the mythological pagan worship of the Egyptians. And of course, God dealt with it. But yet it's amazing that when they get up to the gateway of Canaan at Kadesh Barnea and they turned away in unbelief, God doesn't remind them of the horrible sin of the golden calf. He doesn't remind them of any other horrible sins that they may have been guilty of, but all he is distressed with, they could not believe what he told them. And you see, that's the whole problem of the human race even today. It's not the various sins that they're committing. It's not the drugs. It's not the alcohol. It's not the immorality. It's unbelief. Because, you see, faith is the opposite of unbelief, and faith does everything that squashes these things that we consider as wickedness and sin. So it boils down to the same premise. The human race's great dilemma is simply unbelief. Now, the book of Hebrews, again, as I've been rehearsing over and over, is written, yes, to the Hebrews. But, you know, it's not a book like Romans, as I mentioned, I think, in our very first program. You do not find the plan of salvation laid out in the book of Hebrews like you would in Romans or even Ephesians and Galatians. But nevertheless, just because it's addressed to Hebrews does not mean that we ignore it or neglect it. It is loaded with things that are still apropos for us in the age of grace. Now, my own personal opinion, and I've been doing a lot of reading on these things, I can't find that even the great theologians agree, this book of Hebrews is not written to the dispersed Jews in general. For example, honey, turn back with me to the little book of James, right after Hebrews, so it'd be real easy to find. 
Hebrews chapter 1, verse, I mean uh, James chapter 1, verse 1. And, and this points up what I'm driving at. That Paul does not address this letter to the Hebrews in like manner as James does his letter. Because look what James says. James chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes scattered abroad. Now you see the difference? James is writing to the Jews in the dispersion wherever they were. Now if you'll come back to Hebrews chapter 3 as we get ready to move on, this letter to the Hebrews is more than likely addressed to one rather substantial Hebrew congregation. Not just to the Jews out in the dispersion, but to a particular group. Now, of course, there's controversy. What group was it? Was it the Jerusalem church? I don't think so. Was it the Alexandrian church? Because Alexander Egypt always had a large Jewish community, a large synagogue. And for that reason, you remember the Septuagint. The translation of the Hebrew Scriptures into the Greek was done by the 70 Jewish scholars, not in Jerusalem, but down in Alexandria. So there's that possibility it could have been addressed to a Jewish congregation in Alexandria, but I don't think so. My own pet idea, and I can't find anyone else to agree with me to confirm it, but my own pet idea is it may have been a place like Pella. Now, of course, Pella was one of the Decapolis cities of Rome, located just east of Galilee in what today, of course, is Jordan. And the reason I'm kind of picking on Pella in my own mind, several years ago I read an article in one of the archaeology magazines where archaeologists had found pots herds. Now you remember what that is. That's bits of clay out of which the pots and the kettles and so forth had deteriorated. But those little pieces of clay is what the archaeologists can more or less reconstruct. But see, they found pots herds in the ancient city of Pella that in the same piece of clay, not in separate pieces, but in the same piece of clay, they would have the mark of the fish, which of course designated the early, the early church, but also in the same piece of clay, a menorah, which spoke of the Hebrew. And so we know there had to have been Jews living at least in Pella, and I'm sure many other areas, who were adherents of the fish, the followers of Jesus of Nazareth and Peter's preaching and so forth, but were still clinging to their Judaism and consequently the mark of the menorah. And so I have to feel that this book of Hebrews was written maybe to a synagogue of Jews like unto that. Now, I'm not saying that it was Pella, but I think it had to be a congregation on that order where you had Jews still clinging to Judaism and yet they had seen enough of Jesus of Nazareth and now hearing Paul's approach to the crucified, resurrected Lord, that Paul is now admonishing these Jewish people to just simply come away from their Judaism, from all of their roots of their religion in the past, and step into this gospel of grace. So maybe that'll help a little bit to understand the approach of Hebrews. It has no real church language per se. For example, when I say there's no church language, you understand, never do you see in here a gospel of Christ having died for the sins of the world. Rather, we see Christ in his high priestly role. You don't see the death, burial, and resurrection promoted as a means of justification. It's just not in here. You don't see any reference to pastors and deacons and bishops and so forth like you do in Paul's other epistles. And so this is why I say that you cannot find true church language in Hebrews, but everything that's in Hebrews is for our learning. My, it's just a wealth, and I think you're going to see that this afternoon, that every time you go into another verse, here's just a whole truckload of wisdom and knowledge for us today. And so this is the way we're approaching this book of Hebrews. Even though it's written to Hebrew people, yet my what we can learn from it. All right, so verse 12, here we go. Take heed. Take heed. Now that's a warning, see? Take heed, brethren. Now again, I think Paul uses that word brethren in the, in the vernacular of the Jewish people as his brethren in the flesh but also there were some true believers. Now I'm saying some because not all of them were. 
And we'll be looking at that a little further as we go back to Kadesh Barnea as well. All right, so he can speak to the group and include some of them as brethren, either from the Jewish point or from the fact that they were believers. So he says, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of immorality. No. An evil heart of drunkenness. No. An evil heart of anything else you can think of? No. But what? Unbelief. Unbelief. Oh, it's an awful word. Now remember, the only sin that will send people to a devil's hell is unbelief. They've refused to believe what God has said. That's all. And so here again, this is the whole point. Take heed lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. And remember, we're never going to lose sight of the fact that that's what kept Israel out of the promised land when Moses took them up to Kadesh. It wasn't anything else. Unbelief. Now, let me rehearse again. I know we cover this quite in detail in our last taping. So for people who get these daily, that was just yesterday morning. So I have to kind of remember that. But on the other hand, remember that when the children of Israel had received the law and the tabernacle and the whole religion, as we call it, of Judaism, they were now ready to go into the promised land. And what had God told them? You won't have to lift a sword. Today we'd say you won't have to fire a shot. I'm going to drive the Canaanites out ahead of you. I'll use hornets. Whatever it takes, I'm just going to drive them out. And God said, I'm going to drive them out slow enough so that you can occupy it without the vineyards going up in weeds or wild animals taking over. We'll just push them out and push them out and push them out and you come in and settle it. My, what an offer. Was God serious? Absolutely. He meant every word of it. And then you remember the first step of unbelief, and I don't think very many people point it out or even catch it. The first step of unbelief was, well, can we send in some spies? God didn't tell them to send in spies. That was Israel's idea. That was their first step of unbelief. They couldn't take God at His word that it was there for the taking. Well, let us send in spies. So God and His love and His gracious condescending, this is all right. I'll let you do that. Pick out one man from each tribe and they can go in. All right, so the spies go in and they see the fruit of it. They come back with the fruit of it. The proof that it was a land flowing with milk and honey. Now I always have to explain that. That didn't mean that the honey was coming down through the gullies. <laughs> It didn't mean that milk was running from the other side, but all the attributes of a country or a land that would promote the production of milk and honey was there. And all you got to do is just use a little sense. What does it take to produce milk? Well, you have to have grass and pastures and cattle. And uh, that, of course, gives rise to all the byproducts of a dairy cow. It uh, brought in their, their cheeses. Now, if you don't think the Jews don't like cheese, you haven't been to a Jerusalem breakfast. Isn't that right, Sharon? Oh, all the cheeses are laid out. Well, you see, that was all implied with that statement, the land of milk. And uh, that would require grass and forage and so forth. Now, then honey, of course, as most of you are aware, you don't get honey unless you've got bees, and bees can't make honey unless they've got what? Flowering things, fruit trees and flowers and so forth. And so when you hear the term land of milk and honey, look at the big picture, see? It was a land that provided all the necessities of dairy, dairy cattle. It had all the things necessary for the production of bees and their honey, which spread out into a land of beauty, production, all right, and they brought back the fruits of it. But what did 10 of the 12 say? The majority report was, can't do it. The minority report said, yes, we can, <laughs> Joshua and Caleb. But what did the nation listen to? The majority. That's why from day one on this program, I've made the statement over and over. When it comes to the things of God and of the Spirit, the majority is usually wrong. You can't follow the majority. And I always have to come back to the verse that the Lord Himself spoke. Narrow, narrow is the way, and few there be that find it. 
And beloved, that word few is getting smaller every day. My, I was just reading something again the other day that our whole younger generation, the vast majority of our kids, not all, but the vast majority have no concept of what's right and wrong. They're taught nothing from this book anymore. And you know, a lot of our language is based on things scriptural. In other words, you, you, you've often read, even in a secular account, a Damascus experience. Well, what does that mean to our younger generation? Nothing. They don't know about a Damascus experience, see? And that's just one example. And so we are now in a time when the way is getting narrower and fewer and fewer people that are coming into it. And it's sad. But we're going to see why here as we move on through Hebrews. All right, so Israel now has to be constantly on our mind as they're sitting there at the gates of Canaan at Kadesh Barnea. God has told them go in, and in their unbelief, they reject it. All right, so he says, take heed that you do not have that evil heart of unbelief in departing from the what God? The living God. Now the casual reader don't even think of that twice. But stop a moment. How many of the religions of this world, from all the way back to the present, worship a living God? Not many. In fact, none other than Christianity. Look at your pagans. Look at Hindu. Look at Buddha. Shintos, you name it. Do they worship a living God? No, they worship a dead idol. And that's what the scripture calls them. They're just dead idols. Dumb idols is what it's called in one place. They can't even speak. And so they're not a living God. They're a dead God. They're a God of the mind and, and of the imagination. And they're a, they're a God that Satan uses and empowers from his side of the, of the court. But they're dead gods. But you see, we're different. Here we stand as believers, and our faith is in the living God. Now, I went through my concordance the other night, and I found 28 times from Genesis through Revelation where you find this term, the living God. The living God. Now, you remember when David confronted old Goliath. That was one of the first times it was used that Goliath had the audacity to try and withstand the living God. Well, he found out to his own doom that it just won't work. And so all the way up through Scripture, you have these various accounts of the living God. And it's from two points of view. Either the living God as the God of wrath and judgment, as he was to old Goliath, or he's the living God who brings joy and peace and bliss to the believer. All right, now of these 28 times then that the living God is referred to in your whole Bible, four of them are in Hebrews alone. Isn't that amazing? Four times out of the 28, it's in Hebrews. Now this is the one, and the next one I think is in chapter 9, verse 14. And we'll just look at them quickly so that you'll get the impact of just Two words, the living God. And see, that's why it is so paramount that we understand that Christ arose from the dead. We don't worship a dead Christ. The tomb is empty, and our faith is in a living God. All right, in chapter 9, verse 14. <clears throat> Chapter 9 of Hebrews, verse 14, How much more shall the blood of Christ, that is, beyond what the animal blood was in the Old Testament economy, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God and purge your conscience from dead works to serve who? The living God. That's where we are. We are serving the living God. All right, the next one is in chapter 10, if I remember right. Uh, 1031, hope that's where it is. Chapter 10, verse 31. Now here's the other side of the coin. 
My, this living God can be bliss and joy to the believer, but he's going to be the opposite to the unbeliever. And here it is, chapter 10, verse 31, for it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of what? The living God. From eternity past to eternity future. And he's always the same living God. All right, next one is in chapter 12. Verse 22. Now here we come to the good part again. This is our part of the living God. For the lost person, he's going to be the God of wrath and judgment. It's going to be an awful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But for us, now verse 22, but you are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God. Not the earthly Jerusalem, but which one? The heavenly, see? The heavenly Jerusalem. And into an innumerable company of angels. And so here is where we are today. My, with our knowledge of Scripture and with the unfolding of the power of the Holy Spirit, we are evidenced every day that we are serving a living God. Now, in the few moments I have left in this program, we shared it with quite a few of our seminars over the last couple of weeks as we traveled, because just uh, a couple, three weeks before we left, I had two or three times, and those were just sort of little uh, nudges for me to maybe share this with more people, where someone would either write or call that they had been sharing the scriptures with someone. The one in particular was a gentleman who wrote, and he said, I've been sharing the scriptures with my 18-year-old granddaughter. And he says, I was getting along just fabulously, answering all her questions until she finally said, but now, Grandpa, how do you know that that Bible is true? And he says, then I was stumped. He said, I couldn't think of a thing to tell her. And you know, I had had the same thing happen with a lady in one of my classes here in Oklahoma. She had come up against the same thing. Somebody had just hit her broadside. Well, why do you believe that book, the Bible? And she said, I was stumped. Well, you see, I've taught it over and over and over. And I hope that people will finally start latching on to it. You ask, you answer those kind of questions with two words, the Jew, the Jew. He is living proof that this book is true. Because you see, all the way back as far as Deuteronomy chapter 30, which Moses, of course, wrote 1,500 years before Christ, which is 3,500 years ago from now, Moses wrote that the nation of Israel would be scattered into every nation under heaven. None accepted. And as I've mentioned so often in my teaching, uh, uh, James Mishner in his book, The Source, which chases a Jewish family from antiquity up to, the president, up to the present, in his research, he found that indeed there were Jews in every sovereign state on the planet, none accepted. All right, and Moses wrote that that would happen, but Moses wrote in the next verse that one day, he didn't say when, but that one day the nation of Israel would be back in their homeland. And we're seeing it against all the odds. Now, the average person doesn't stop to think. Can you imagine a nation of people as small as Israel, never more than 10 million, today they're around 15, I think 16 million, and that's probably as much as they've ever been, and yet here, this small little nation of people were driven out into every nation under heaven, persecuted like you and I have no idea, and yet never lost their identity. Now, you would have thought that under ordinary circumstances, they would have assimilated into the Gentile nations and they would have disappeared. But they didn't. They kept their national identity. And here they are, 3,500 years later, just exactly like this book said they would, they're in the land. And they're not just in the land, they're in the news every day of the week. 
Now, I've been asking my crowds of people everywhere as we've gone, can you believe this? Can you believe a little nation of less now in the land of five million people living in a geographical area no bigger than part of New Jersey? And yet they're in the news every day and they still have their national identity. They're still keeping the various feast days and holidays. And you think that's normal? Why, that is miraculous as anything can be. And yet, it's exactly what this book said would happen. And so there's your proof that along with all the other things, see now we know there were hundreds of definitive prophecies fulfilled at Christ's first coming. But see, that's still easy for the scoffer to push aside and say, well, that's just the way you look at it. But they cannot deny that the nation of Israel that began back here in Genesis is now in the land again today. And they are, like I've said before, and I'll say it again, they're in the news every day. Why? There are other areas of the world that are in just as big a turmoil. In fact, I've been using Sri Lanka, every place I've been, as an example, the old island of Ceylon. And after we got back home, I was reading the Daily Oklahoma the other day, and they're still having all kinds of war and turmoil in Sri Lanka. Does the world get shook up about that? No, they don't even pay any attention. In Africa, all the places of turmoil and torture in Africa, does the world get all upset and send the Secretary of States all over to them? No. But all oh, that little nation of Israel draws everybody's attention, see? And just take heart. The next time you see Israel in the news, you just tell yourself, proof positive, that my Bible is indeed the supernatural, Holy Spirit, divinely inspired Word of God which proves that, yes, we serve a living God, a God who's been in control of human history now for 6,000 years. And you know, I've said it on the program more than once, how miraculous that God started everything back there in the garden and left man with a free will, left nations with a free will. They're not puppets on a string. And yet here we are 6,000 years later and we are right on schedule. We're not off one day. We're not off a week. I think I can say we're not off one hour. God's Word is true. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.